here we go with Trump's travel ban video two, the constitutional issues. As you know, I'm Peter Martelis of the Roger Williams University School of Law in beautiful Rhode Island. These materials are educational in nature and they do not constitute legal advice, so don't rely on them. What's the constitutional claim here? Well, it's the Establishment Clause, part of the First Amendment. The factual basis here was Trump's statements, particularly his statements as candidate and then as president-elect and the statements of his surrogates like the ever-entertaining Rudy Giuliani. The most compelling evidence were the statements as a candidate. For example, Trump talked about the need for a total and complete shutdown of Muslim immigration to the United States. And Trump said, I think Islam hates us. There's tremendous hatred there. After the election, Rudy Giuliani entered from stage left, uh, and he said that Trump called him and asked, well, put a commission together, Rudy. Show me the right way to do this legally. Trump on the travel ban 3.0 then said it was a watered down version of the original man, which meant that any animus, any bias or bad motive that affected the first ban affected the second and third versions as well. Here's travel ban 3.0 under the establishment clause. So you need to know this is an unclear area of law. The central purpose uh, per our framer, James Madison, was preventing state control over personal issues of religious belief and practice. Uh, and the foremost case is the Lemon v. Kurtzman case from 1971. That has a test that's been quoted ad infinitum, but we'll repeat it here. The test is as follows. One, uh, in order for this not to be an establishment clause violation, you need to show a secular purpose. That is not a religious purpose, a plain old secular purpose. In addition, the measure can have the primary effect of helping or, for that matter, hindering religion. So it can't help, but can't hurt either. That's a primary effect as what the legislators or the executive really have in mind. And then finally, it can involve excessive government entanglement with religion, particularly with the operation of religion, its liturgy, prayer, etc. Next question, well, how good is the fit between the purposes served by the Establishment Clause and the role of the nation in foreign affairs? And pretty clearly, the Supreme Court said the fit is not all that good. So for one thing, bear in mind is that foreign policy often involves mixed motives. Motives are hardly ever pure in this area. Good examples, President Harry Truman recognized Israel uh, and explaining that, he privately cited to friends and advisors a passage from Deuteronomy in the Old Testament in which God instructed the Israelites to settle the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Resonant words indeed. Did Truman wish to help Judaism as a religion? Well, quite possibly. Quite possibly want to help Judaism. But it's also true that President Truman wanted to protect Jews from genocide after the appalling experience of the Holocaust in World War II. And in addition, Truman, in a very pragmatic way, that's consistent with U.S. interests overall, wanted to establish a friendly democracy in the Middle East to compete with the power of the Soviet Union. What do we say about immigration and the First Amendment overall? Well, there the lead case is Kleindienst versus Mandel. Kleindienst was Richard Kleindienst, Attorney General under President Nixon, and later a convicted felon. Mandel was not a convicted felon, but he was a radical, self-described radical from abroad who wanted to come here and lecture. But the, so the test was, is the government action, here the action in denying Mandel a waiver that will have allowed him to come to the United States, was this government action facially legitimate and bona fide? Bona fide means good faith. It's important to remember that the action must be bona fide in good faith only on its face, right? So you only look at the face of the policy, the actual words of the policy, the text of the policy. You don't look behind the document to see what's really going on. 
that's a very deferential standard, the government almost always wins. And indeed, that is what happened here. More in the political branches and immigration. Well, in Hawaii, in this section of the opinion, the court cited control over the entry of foreign nationals as a core signature of sovereignty, a hallmark of sovereignty. And the court's language makes this absolutely clear. Chief Justice Roberts, in his opinion, said that the admission of foreign nationals is a fundamental sovereign attribute. It's exercised by the government's political departments, that is by the president and by Congress, and it's largely immune from judicial control. The clear message, courts, stay the heck out. Now, there's a second test here, in addition to that facially legitimate and bona fide test that the court applies in First Amendment areas involving immigration. This is the familiar rational basis test. We see that in equal protection cases. And Roberts threw that in here as kind of a secondary rationale. He probably threw it in largely because he wanted to show retiring Justice Kennedy that Roberts was serious about individual rights. And so he's willing to apply an additional test just to see if uh, the government would fail under that test, just to make sure. The Roberts uh, also said that the travel ban would pass rational basis review. In other words, that the ban was reasonably related to an important governmental objective. And here that objective was aiding security. How did Roberts get to this result under the rational basis test? Well, Roberts cited equal protection cases like City of Cleburne versus Cleburne Living Center. Cleburne involved a local law in Texas that required a special permit for establishment of a group home for people with intellectual disabilities. The court looked closely at the town's reasons for the special permit procedure. The town had said, well, we, we are worried about congestion, we're worried about traffic and noise. So we got out of this special permit. This group home is gonna create a lot of traffic and the noise will be just deafening. But the justices asked at the oral argument, which I was actually present for back in 1985, they asked, well, what about other uses like hospitals or dormitories? Don't they create traffic and noise too? But yet you haven't regulated them, town. You haven't asked them to put up for a special permit. And that made a difference to the judges uh, who said this ban uh, is basically unconstitutional. It doesn't pass the rational basis test because it's clearly not related to reasonable government objectives because you got all these uses like dorms and hospitals that are not subject to the special permit procedure at all. So Roberts looked here at the objectives at issue and he said, well, you got this identity management objective that we talked about in our first video on the statutory issues. And he said here, uh, identity management was a powerful enough rationale to meet the standard of something that's reasonably related to an important government objective. Even though, as we discovered before, we talked about identity management, it's clear that many of the countries that are included in the ban actually did a pretty good job of identity management. And there are a whole bunch of countries that were not included that didn't do any kind of job at all. But Robert still said there's a loose fit, at the very least, between ends and means, and that's all you need in this very deferential area. Um, furthermore, Robert said that travel ban, ban 3.0 allowed students to enter, so its impact on Muslims was less severe than earlier versions, which means that the ban, according to Roberts, wasn't targeting Muslims. In addition, Roberts noted that the three countries with the highest Muslim populations on earth India, which has the most Muslims of any country, Pakistan, and Indonesia were not even on the list. And so Robert said, well, this can't be much of a Muslim ban if the three most populous Muslim countries are not included. So that was really the reasoning there. In the process, the court in, uh, overruled the Korematsu case, the case which had said that it was okay for the government to force Japanese Americans to evacuate their homes on the West Coast 
uh, and prescribe criminal penalties for those who fail to obey that military order. Uh, the court said that those reasons were clearly unconstitutional, but in fact, those reasons were pretty much as solid as the reasons in the Muslim ban. Not to say they're solid at all, but if you believe the Muslim ban, then why say that Korematsu was not okay? They're pretty much on the same page. At least one could argue that. Indeed, that's what Justice Sotomayor asserted in her powerful dissent. She said the ban is over-inclusive. It includes a lot of folks who can't possibly pose a threat. Say infants, toddlers, they're not a national security threat, but they are covered by the ban just the same. The majority, according to Justice Sotomayor, ignored the animus, that is, the dislike of a group that Trump's comments reflected, like utter and complete shutdown of Muslim immigration. So the court really engaged in a very uh, willfully ignorant analysis. Justice Sotomayor said, don't confuse this with the facts. That's pretty much Justice Sotomayor's take of how the majority operated here. And indeed, also, Justice Sotomayor said, overruling Korematsu was a travesty because the court tolerated the same kind of fear and hatred in the travel ban case that led to that shameful chapter of the Japanese-American internment during World War II. Now, Breyer's dissent was a, a bit narrower, kind of a narrower focus than Justice Sotomayor's very powerful opinion. Breyer instead focused on the lack of any real waiver process for the measures in the travel ban. He said that was a real problem here. So between the two of them, you had to have uh, both the powerful dissent from Justice Sotomayor who said that the majority is not living up to the ideals that it put forward when it overruled Korematsu. And your Justice Breyer said there's a waiver process, but it's not a real waiver process, kind of a Potemkin or a fake waiver process. And without a waiver process, Justice Breyer said, you don't have the kind of exceptions that you need to make this a humane and lawful ban. But the majority had its way. And again, the key explainer here is that in this realm of foreign affairs and national security, the government almost always wins.